entrepreneurs. Today, Dawn is going to uncover how selling can become second nature when approaching the right mindset and techniques. So in this session, he'll help us to rewire our mindset around sales to make selling feel natural and authentic, learn practical techniques to overcome your sales anxiety, and engage with proven strategies to close deals effortlessly. As a reminder, this is an interactive session, so we want to hear from you. If you look at the bottom toolbar of your screen, we will see a chat button. We encourage you to use that throughout the webinar when you have a question or comment for Don. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it on over to get us started. Thank you so much. I hope I can live up to all that. And I think I have um, only about four hours. Is that right? Oh, that's not right. I don't think. <laughs> um, so uh, let me share my screen and we'll get started. Today's meeting is titled Selling for People Who Hate to Sell. So all my life, really starting at age 19, I've been um, one of those people who sold more than anybody at everything I was doing. And uh, people would ask me, they're like, so how do you do it? And I'm like, I don't really even think of myself as a salesperson. I just know that people like to buy from me and I've decided to let them do that. So um, so that's what we're going to talk about today. These fine people here, one of my in-person workshops that we held in Detroit, and they're all heart heartbreakers and life takers. And my goal for you today is that you start your um, journey for improvement in how you sell. So let's see here. Okay, we're going to start out, okay, um, with a public service announcement. So just about every meeting I ever run, I start with what's called One Good Thing. It goes along with my gratitude practice. And um, One Good Thing is where you share something you're grateful for that other people don't know. And um, and I'll go first, and then when we're done, since we have such a crowd, normally we would do this verbally, but since we have such a crowd today, we'll... Um, I'll ask you to put it into the chat. So don't put it into the chat yet. Let me share. And then I'm going to give you about 10 seconds to put something in the chat and hit hit share. So three weeks ago, I had my left hip um, removed and replaced with this titanium. Uh, and so I'm now the bionic man. And my gratitude, what I'm grateful for, is I'm grateful for a cane. Because for three weeks, I've been um, condemned to a walker. And man, I kind of hate that walker. So my one good thing today, I am grateful for a cane. So go into the chat real quick, just one sentence and share one thing you're grateful for. And, and we're not going to read them, but um, we may pass them out later. But the beauty about gratitude is the more that you practice gratitude, the more grateful you become. And the more grateful you become, the better maybe not necessarily the better everything happens in your life, but the better perspective you have. And we're going to talk about perspective and how it comes to not selling and how to sell for people who hate to sell. So hit that chat. Okay. I'm not, I can't see the chat on my screen. I, oh yeah, I can. I see a couple of them in there. Um, if you haven't chatted, chat away. One thing I'm grateful for my dog. I'm grateful for my wife. I'm grateful for, um, a big deal I won yesterday. It doesn't matter what it is, just something that you're grateful for. Okay, and then we are moving on. So before we get started, um, I have to kind of lay some groundwork. So I want to talk to you about the concept of wow. And uh, wow, on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the best, wow starts at 11 and goes on to infinity. Okay, and the reason this is important is because whether you sell a product or service, whatever your business offers, your customers are judging you, yes, on the product, yes, on the service, but more importantly, they're judging you on the experience they had in buying the product and service and their experience with that. So let me give you a, a, a good example of a wow. I'm on a flight. I travel a lot. I'm on a flight the other day. I'm flying to Houston. Uh, I'm sitting up front. And um, at the end of the flight, and our, my flight attendant is just a delight. She smiles. She laughs. She jokes. She's efficient. She's proficient. You know, she's like super good. At the end of the flight, and I don't think I have it here. Well, if I don't. 
but she hands me a handwritten thank you card that says, Mr. Williams, thank you so much for allowing me to serve you on this American flight today. And I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you come back and see us again. And I'm like, wow, that is such excellent customer service. Okay. And then the fact, not only that she said thank you and appreciated that I was a customer, but that she did it in writing. Okay. And then the next piece of that is that it was a total surprise. And so I wrote a book about six, seven years ago called Romancing Your Customer, which tells you how to deliver experiences that um, your customers will actually love doing business with your company. And one element, element of romance is surprise, is that somebody doesn't know. So today we're going to talk about wow, and I'm going to encourage you to deliver some wow into your customer's journey as we go forward. Um, ladies, remind me, how long, how long do I have today? You have until the end of the hour, and let's just save a few minutes for Q and A. Perfect. Okay. And the reason I ask is I I end every meeting on time or early, um, because that's how you do wow. So today we're going to talk about three things, and I'm going to give you about three different um, learnings on three things. But today we're going to talk about mindset. Okay. And um, in the intro of the call, I heard, you know, that Petra is a mind shift organization. I love that. You cannot sell all you should sell. You cannot be all you can be without the right mindset. We're also going to talk about the mechanics of selling. There is some levers to pull and buttons to push and wheels to turn um, that make the process work. And then the third is we're going to talk about not making people buy because I, I don't know how to do that. I don't have the foggiest idea, but I do know how to let people buy. And, um, and so we'll talk about that. So let's go to mindset first. So... Um, Raise your hand or, or put it in, go to the chat and, and either put in love or hate. I love to sell or I hate to sell. Go to the chat, put in the one word, love or hate, please. Okay. And ladies, if you would give me an idea kind of what's coming in. We're and getting a pretty even mix here. Love, hate, oh, hates are coming in strong now, <laughs> but it is a pretty even mix. Okay, good, good. Well, those of you who love to sell, you're my brothers and sisters. And those of you who hate to sell, you're my future brothers and sisters, because we're all going to end up there. So, you know, sale, selling is one of those things where when you aren't selling as much as you want to sell, as much as you think you should sell, you know, you die a little bit. Every no, a salesperson, um, they, they, they just die a little bit. But then as soon as they get a yes, they're completely reborn, completely resurrected. They love what they do. Life is good. The sun is shining. Birds are singing. Life is good. And so the trick on mindset is this, lower the peaks, raise the valleys and run a little more even keel. So I'm a really big believer of wise words. And so it's interesting to me that if you study Plato and Aristotle and Seneca and Demosthenes and all the ancient philosophers, all the Stoics, okay, that their words that they first articulated 2000 years ago are still relevant today. And, and so wisdom really never goes out of style. Everything else, you know, bell bottoms do and, uh, you know, low cut jeans and skinny jeans will go out of style. Maybe they've already gone out of style. That'd be a good thing. Um, anyhow, wise words don't go out of style. Wisdom doesn't go out of style. This is my favorite quote of all time. And one that I recommend to my uh, sales clients and to my entrepreneur clients that they um, say, every single day. And that is you are far better, far smarter, and far stronger than you think. Can anybody put in the chat, does anybody know which philosopher penned those words the first time? Got anybody chiming in, ladies? <laughs> We've got Andy Bailey. 
<laughs> it's not Andy Bailey. No. Any other thoughts? No. Crickets. Okay. Well, kind of a trick question. This quote is taken from the book Winnie the Pooh. And Christopher Robin said this to the bear. Um, but it's certainly true of everyone. Everybody has a little bit of imposter syndrome. Um, some people have a lot. Some people have a little. Hopefully, whatever you have, you're working to shrink that. But I assure you, you're far better, far smarter, and far stronger than you think. And I think that I got thank you think. Actually, mean than you think. So, um, so very important on mindset. Uh, read the good books. Watch the tapes hang around with people that are positive. But the biggest trick I can give you on mindset is this. There's a part of your brain called the reticular activator and everybody has it and it's not catching and it's not bad. Um, the reticular activator, I'll tell you a short story. My youngest son, when he was 16, he wanted a Volkswagen GTI, which I did in fact buy for him, never buy that car for a teenage boy, very, very fast car. So I had never even, I didn't even know what the car was. I'd never seen one, never heard of it. And I said, well, let's go look at it and we'll, we'll see. And so um, we go and look at the car and I'm like, yeah, it's a nice car. Um, but then for the, like the next two weeks, everywhere I go, and I live in Dallas, Fort Worth. So there's a ton of traffic, ton of cars everywhere I go. There's a GTI, there's a GTI, there's a GTI, there's a GTI, there's a GTI. Now, the question is, is were there really more GTIs on the road? Answer is no. No more GTIs that two weeks than the two weeks before. What happened is my mind woke up to the concept of that car. And so it begins to find those cars for me. It starts searching those cars out. And mindset is the same way when it comes to selling. You actually make the sale when your feet hit the floor in the morning, okay? Not when you get in front of that prospect. And so I want to encourage you to build a set of affirmations that you either write and or speak every day, okay? Um, and if you'll put the word affirmations in the chat, I'll send you uh, a worksheet, a one pager, simple, nothing for you to buy, but we'll help you build 10 affirmations for you to begin articulating every day to activate that reticular activator and to begin. I don't know how to perfect your mindset. And what I'm going to share with you today is like, I don't know perfection. I know improvement. And so if you were a mountain climber and you were in, Africa, and you were going to go up Kilimanjaro, that would look really daunting from the bottom. Okay. It would look almost impossible. But if you look down at your feet and you said, can I take one single step? That would look really simple. And so everything I'm going to show you today, I'm not going to ask you to climb to the top of the mountain. I'm going to ask you to take one single step. And then I'm going to ask you to do it again the next day and the next day. And you're going to be shocked at how far you come, how fast, and how easy it was. Okay, so let's talk about mechanics. Man, we live in a world of, I think, 8 billion people. Do you know how many of those 8 billion people are prospects for you. And if you know, put in the chat, K-N-O-W, I know. And if you don't know, just put a question mark. Because the first thing we have to do is we have to know who our prospects are. And most people who come to me, and I spend most of, I do, I work with entrepreneurs, but most of my clients are Fortune 500 companies. And so when I ask them, who are your buyers? Who is your avatar? Who is your ideal customer? Most of the time I get two answers. I don't know. Or, well, everybody. 
And of course, that's not true. Everybody, if you sell water, if you sell air, if you sell food, everybody could be your prospect. But if you sell something, if you sell air conditioning services, if you sell fences, if you sell consulting, if you sell CPA services, everybody is not your client. And, and, and let's drill on the CPA for just a second. You know, every business is not your best client. There are certain types of businesses that are ideal for you and, and everyone else is not poor, but less than ideal. And so if we're going to use our brains, we want to work with the people that are ideal prospects for us, not the people that are less than ideal. So um, here's a good way to know. If you've decided, if you've defined, this is my avatar, this is my perfect customer, this is my ideal customer, okay, super. If you haven't, I'm going to encourage you to do that today. And, and this is not like a five-day project. This is not a five-hour project. This is probably a five-minute project. And if, and if you're at a loss on where to start, just look at your current customers and look at the two or three that are the best customers for your business. People who spend the most money, people that are the easiest to deal with, people that you provide the most value. And then look at what demographically makes them similar. Are they in the same annual sales range? Are they owned by um, men or women? Are they in what geographic range? Okay, and you'll be able to see the similarities. And then what we want to do is we want to take that ideal customer, that avatar, and we want to go find out how many of those people are in the world. And here's a real easy way to do that. You can go to, um, and I have no interest in this company, and you can do this for free. You can go to a list broker like AccuLeads, um, and there's a bunch of them. Just do it like this. Just Google um list brokers and you can go and type in my geographic preferences um, let's just say i had a yoga studio and i i live where i'm at where i'm sitting today is i'm north of dallas fort worth in between dallas fort worth and denton texas so north of dfw international airport so if i had a yoga studio which i do not have um my geography would be let's say a five mile radius of my physical location. Okay. Now there's 8 million people here in the Metroplex, but nobody's driving 45 minutes or an hour and a half. Cause you never really know when 45 minutes might be two hours with traffic, you know, to come to yoga three times a week. So probably my ideal customers are within a five mile radius. And, and then if I'm going to use my brain, which I think you should, um, they either live within a five mile radius or they work within a five mile radius. Okay. Because some people might come and do yoga before they go into the office or after the office or at lunch. And so that would be my geography and maybe, uh, and I've never been a member of a yoga studio, but let's say I charge $150 a month. So I need people that make, uh, in Dallas, Fort Worth, I need people that make $75,000 and up, probably. And I think 90% um, of yoga practitioners in the U.S. are female. Um, and I could find that out on ChatGPT or um, Google. And so I begin plugging these in. And those list broker tools will tell you, here's how many people look like that in this five mile radius. And then if you want, you can purchase that list, rent the list technically. And, um, and they're probably, you know, the records are probably less than a dime, maybe as, as little as a nickel each. And so they're relatively inexpensive. But at that point, you've gotten real clear, you've gotten real decisive on who is your prospect. And um, we could go the other route, go business to business. So I coach um, business people and entrepreneurs all over the world. So my geography is the entire 
planet. I don't have a client in Antarctica. I'm looking for one. If you know one, I'll cut them a special deal. Um, and then most of my clients are two to 20 million in revenue, but I have some that are 150 in addition to the Fortune 500. And so I'm able to build that. And then I know exactly who I should be putting my time, effort, and energy into not selling really, but letting them buy. So mechanic number one is the who, and I've given you some strategies on how you can not only find out, define the who, but find out the actual names of your who's. So next is what. So here's how most people sell. Uh, let's say I run down to the local Chevrolet dealership today and I'm looking at new Corvettes. Okay. And it's guys like me that buy Corvettes. The 20 year old guys, they don't buy them because they can't afford them. It's the six year old guys. And so, um, so I fit the demographic. Okay. And I walk on to the lot and the salesperson comes out, except today it's 185 degrees here in Dallas Fort Worth. So you wouldn't do it today. But anyhow, I go to the car dealership. I'm looking at the Corvette, the car salesperson comes out and initiates conversation. And I'm like, tell me about the car. And they start telling me, hey, it's zero to 60 in 3.6 seconds. And here's the horsepower and here's the gear ratio. And here's all that. And they're telling me features, features, features. Okay. And almost if you look at how you handle sales talk, that's probably how you do that in your own um, company and how your salespeople do it. It's when they're engaged with the prospect, it's like, let me tell you the features. So here's the thing. The 60-year-old guy at the Chevrolet dealership looking at the Corvette, unless he's a car nerd, you know, unless he's a, unless he's a car nerd, he doesn't really care. Why is he interested? Go to the chat, wake up your chat. Give me one word. Why is he interested in the Corvette? And ladies, read me a couple answers. All right. Someone says to feel good, status, status, cool, speed. Yeah, I, I like all those. And if you refine it even further, that 60-year-old guy wants to be as sexy as he thought he was when he was 30. And that car does it for him. Okay. And so if you want to sell and if, or, or maybe better said, if you want people to buy from you, you have to talk to people from their perspective, what's important to them. Okay. Is it important that it's three quarter inch cedar board on board top rail? Probably not. What's important is this is a very secure fence. And what that means is it will prevent people from accessing your property. It will prevent people from seeing into your property and it will improve the value of your property. So those are all benefits. And you want to be certain that you're relating to your customers and your prospective customers on the benefit side, a little bit of feature, but a lot of benefit. And then the last that we'll talk about in mechanics today, and I mean, there's a whole toolbox, but we don't have that much time, um, is how are you going to communicate to your prospects? And um, so let's just say social. I'm a big believer. I think, I think at the bare minimum, you have to be on Facebook and you have to be on LinkedIn. And when I talk about Facebook, people are like, well, I have a personal Facebook account. I don't have a business account. I'm like, man, you have to have both. Okay. And you have to post business content on your personal and you have to post personal on your business. Okay. People want, people don't have relationships with companies and even fortune 500 companies don't have relationships with fortune 500 companies. People in companies have relationships with people in companies. And so you have to be a people, okay? And you got to share some stuff. Um, you'll be surprised. More people will like you than not. Some won't. 
I have some haters. God love them. Okay. So that's the Facebook side. You have to be on the LinkedIn side. Okay. Certainly if you're business to business and really even if you're business to consumer, because prospects will go look at your profile on LinkedIn in their decision-making process on, am I actually going to buy from this person? And so at the bare minimum, you need a Facebook, two Facebook profiles, two LinkedIn profiles. Now, I'm a big believer in Instagram and TikTok and, and I don't know what all we're on. We're on just about everything. But but that's one way I need to show up in the world. The other thing about how we're going to communicate is um, how, and all that social, let me roll back social for a second. All that social is to build trust. Social media posts will not make sales. Okay. Digital advertising and social media can generate leads and leads go on to sales. Okay. But posts typically not, but it's, it's how you build trust. And so here's the rule on trust. No trust, no trust, no sales. That's that. No trust, K-N-O-W trust, no sales, K-N-O-W sales. Trust is the number one reason people do not buy and they, and in fact, they will not buy if they do not have trust. They don't actually have to like you. They have to trust and respect you to buy from you. So the other thing on how is this. How are we going to market? How are we going to reach out to the who's? Are we going to do direct mail? Are we going to do email? Are we going to do uh, digital marketing? Are we going to canvas and knock on doors? Um, and... And as you're deciding the how, and this is typically something you probably want to get a professional to help you with, but as you're deciding the how, here's kind of like the overlying theory is this. Whatever everybody else is doing, whatever all your competitors are doing, do something else. And that way you'll stand out from the crowd. Okay. Customer journey. I'm going to ask you to go back to the chat with a yes or no, just a yes or no. If you have physically mapped out the journey your customer takes from being one of the 8 billion people in the world to the marketing they see, their interaction with sales, their onboarding, um, and then their customer service journey, if you've physically done that, and the easiest way to do that uh, you can do it with a piece of paper, but it's really a lot simpler with, you know, post-it notes. You just stick them to the wall and then you're like, no, nah, this goes over here and that goes over there. But if you've done that, say yes in the chat. And if you have not done that before this call, please say no. And ladies, what are we getting? A lot of no's, a couple of yeses in there, but a lot of no's. Okay. Good job, you yeses. Very important. And no's. Something you can do today. Again, not a five-day project, not a five-hour project, probably more than five minutes. Okay. And so uh, you literally just take the little stickies and you say, um, saw the ad. Boom. Called the 800 number. Boom. Talk to, uh, well... It, call the 800 number. Did they get an, a live answer or did they get an automated answer? Okay. And what do you think from their perspective, from their eyeglasses, what do they want? Who cares what you want? Okay. And then talked with so-and-so and then call went great. And then um, qualified as a lead and then turned over to sales and you, and you take every step as granular as you can. And you analyze that step from the customer's perspective on, did we deliver at a level of what? At a level of wow. Because if we did, we're going to win a lot of business. And if we didn't, we're not. Many times when we audit client sales processes, what we find is that they have four steps in the process or two or whatever that are actually 
preventing sales. And of course, everything in your onboarding process, everything in your selling process ought to be aimed to that target. Just like you are an archer, I'm going to, I'm going to hit the bullseye every time, ring the bell, make the sale. Okay. You got to, if, if you hate selling, and I hope you do, I don't like selling really. I do like letting people buy. Um, but the number one thing you have to do is you have to stop selling. Selling, and so many of my clients come in there like, I hate, I hate it when I'm salesy. Salesy, I'm not sure what that means, but I hate that. I'm like, well, the thing is, is this. I'm going to approach people from their perspective I'm going to come from a position of service. How can I help you solve your problem? Okay. And if your product or service doesn't solve a problem, there's probably a little work to be done on what you sell. But most people, when they think about selling and most salespeople, they come with this attitude of, I don't know how to make people buy. I'm like, I don't know how to make people buy either. I know how to make it easy for people to buy. And then, of course, they do buy, but I don't know how to make people buy. And then the number one thing I would add here is this. People want to buy. The average household in America, I think average income in America is $58,000 per household. If you live in Dallas-Fort Worth, you're starving. If you live in... Um, Salina, Kansas, you're doing pretty good because the cost of living is different. If you're living in LA, you're living in a box. Okay. But the average household income is like $58,000. And the average household in America does not have $1,000 cash at their disposal. So if they don't live in LA and they don't live in Dallas and they live in all those little towns where they make $58,000, but they don't have $1,000, where'd their money go? Well, they spent it. People aren't in love with the concept of having money. People are in love with the concept of what money will get them. And so when they get their money, they typically go exchange it for product, services, and experience. People desperately want to buy. If they wanted to keep their money, they'd keep more money. They love to buy. Psychologically, does everybody know, uh, and I'll say, I'll pick on women here for a minute. Forgive me, ladies. Does anybody know a woman that has two or three or 400 pairs of shoes? Or at least maybe you've heard of somebody do you think that particular woman loves owning those shoes? She doesn't. She's in love with the action of buying shoes. And it could be men and suits. And it could be whatever. I'm, I'm just picking on the lady. Psychologically, when we reach into our pocket and we put our credit card into the machine or we go to Amazon, oh my gosh, go to Amazon and we buy, we impulse buy, or we write the check. Uh, we're reluctant typically to pay in cash. We don't like, that's kind of human. I don't like to let go of my cash, but, but we're addicted to that moment when in our relationship, you sell or me buyer, I become master and you become servant. And that's at the point of selling. And so once you realize that and you're looking at your customer journey and you're looking at your mechanics and you're working with your mindset, it gets pretty easy to architect things to where people will buy and you can kind of just get out of the selling business altogether. I'm not I'm not interested in trying to make people buy. I'm interested in um, positioning myself, my company, my product, service, and experiences where I can let people buy. This is not my car. Gosh darn it. That's a million and a half dollar Ferrari. But I, I show you this car for this reason. If you were driving this car, the rear view, the exterior mirror there is about, 
I don't know, it's about as big as that card. It's probably not that big, actually. And so if I put you in that car, put you in the driver's seat, put you out on 635, the big highway here in Dallas-Fort Worth, taped over all the windows, can't see anything, but you can look out a little hole through the driver's side window and you can see the mirror. And I'm like, once you drive this car as fast as you can down 635, but all you can do is look in the rear view mirror, look at your past, where you have been, where you came from. It's the only way you know to navigate the car. Well, you're not going to get very far before you have a problem. You're going to be in the ditch or around a tree or in another car or whatever. If we take everything off the glass in the car, we tape up the mirror and we say, okay, you got the side windows, you got the windshield, which is a hundred times larger than that mirror. And you can look about at where you want to go and you can drive as fast as you can drive. Go. You're going to drive a long way. If you view what I've shared with you today from the rear view mirror of your past experiences, nothing will change. If you look out the windshield on where you can take your business and you put incremental work in a little bit every day, sky's the limit. So I want to encourage you, okay, to implement at least one thing from what you've learned in today's call. And if, and if you'll do even just one thing, would you go into the chat and would you just put the number one? And ladies, tell me what you're getting. All right, chat. What have we got? Create positioning. Good. And even if you're not sure which piece you're going to do, they're going to share this DAC. Okay. If you'll just agree to take one step, just put the number one in the chat. That's fine. Morning aspirations, build trust, bunch of ones, lots of ones. Awesome. Okay. I want to encourage you. Here's, here's this, here's the secret to improvement. Learn something new. Okay. And I know that you're learners, you're involved with Petra and you came to Petra because they had things to teach you. Okay. The secret to improvement is learn something new and put it into action. It doesn't work if you don't put it into action. Okay, so take out your phone. Okay, the first hack I gave you was gratitude. I want you to take out your phone, and I want you to put it in camera mode, and I want you to, to um, scan the QR code. This will take you to my LinkedIn profile, and in one click, you can ask to connect. And sure, I'd love to connect with you, but what I really am doing this for is this. This is a really easy way to connect with a lot of people with no friction, okay, as you're with a group of prospects or a group of free prospects, okay? And if you haven't done your own QR code on that same screen up at the top, it will show you um, scan or QR code, and it will build your own QR code to connect on LinkedIn. And so do we have people pointing their cameras at the screen? Point those cameras. Got to act. Okay, moving on. Here's hack number three. We talked about you have to see things from the customer's point of view. So much so that your own internal point of view is almost of no value. Here's the only way I know to see things from the customer's point of view. Take your phone. Go ahead and take your phone. Shake, show me your phone. Shake your phone at me. Good, good, good. Put it in camera mode. Put it in selfie mode. Put it in video mode. Camera selfie, video, 
point it at your face. Here, just do this. We'll do something really simple. I'll do it and then you do it. I'll do it and then I'll say one, two, three, and then we'll do it together. Hi, I'm Don Williams. What's your name? Okay, so you're going to just look at your phone. You're going to look at the camera. You're going to look dead in the camera's eye. And you're going to say, hi, insert your name. Don't say Don Williams. Okay, hi, I'm Don. I'm insert your name here. What's your name? So one, two, three, go. Hi, I'm Don Williams. What's your name? Okay, so you watch that later. And maybe for the first time in a long time, you'll begin to see yourself the way other people see you. I have clients that have physical locations. I encourage them to put their camera in video mode and to walk, park in front of the building, turn the, turn the video camera on and walk in and through the business like they were a customer. And for the first time, you'll begin to see your business the way a customer does. When I look in the mirror, when I look at myself on um, Zoom here, I see 25-year-old Dawn. You do not see 25-year-old Dawn. You see 60-year-old Dawn. And this was uh, brought home to me. My wife was renewing our passport applications. She handed it over to me to review it and sign it. And under hair color, she she put gray. And I looked at her and I was like, gray? What are you talking about? She's like, go look in the mirror. You're so stupid. Okay. Well, I don't see me today. I see me then. And you do the same thing. You see yourself a certain way. You're wearing rose colored glasses. Your people in your business see their your business a certain way. You got to see it from the way the customer sees it. Okay. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to share a couple of minutes with you today. If you'd like an e-copy of my 200-page book on gratitude, if you want to go buy a copy, go to Amazon. We'd love you to do that. But if you'd like a free e-copy, point your camera, get that. This slide will be gone from what I share with Petra and they share with you. And if you download, I'll keep the QR code live until 5 o'clock central today. And so if you want the free ebook before five o'clock central today, go, all you do is put in your name and email and it'll let you download the book because I'm grateful for you. Thank you so much. And my name's Don Williams. I'm Don at donwilliamsglobal.com. My cell is 817-691-4366. I never answer the phone, but if you text <laughs> me, but if you text me, I'll reach back out to you. Okay, and so I'll leave that up there for a minute if you want to get a picture. And I'm going to stop sharing. And it is my custom to always end on time or early. And so thank you so much for your attention today. And I'm here um, up until the top of the hour for Petra if you have any questions or anything I can help with. And ladies, I'll let you moderate if there's any questions and feed them to me. Awesome. Don, thank you so much for your time and your insight. We're going to go ahead and open the floor to Q&A. So in that chat box, uh, let us know what questions you have and we'll start rolling through them. Mm -hmm. I'll start with one question. If there was one first action item you would tell everyone to take who's interested in improving their sales, just one top action item, what would what would it be from today? Start with 10 positive daily affirmations. That's the number one. Yeah. I don't care if it takes you 30 seconds. Every day, recite your 10 positive affirmations. All right. We've got a couple coming in the chat here. Paige says, how do you recommend gaining sales experience if you are not yet in a sales position? Oh, I love that. Okay, so one, um, you got to get in a position, okay? Take a position somewhere. Uh, and two, um, you know, the number one reason, um, and I could talk about sales for a week, but the number one reason people don't sell enough is because they don't ask enough people to buy. And so get in a position and then ask people to buy what you sell. 
okay and um and, and and it needs you there's a little bit of work you have to do you can't just walk up to people and say lexi my name is don please buy my thing okay that's a little bit like hey lexi you want to get married it's like i don't even know you okay um you gotta put in a little work you know on the romancing side ahead of that so um but get in a position and um and then start asking people to buy and start studying how you relate with people. So you look people in the eye, you smile, you show your teeth, you say please and thank you, you do what your mom told you to do, use your manners, okay, and ask people to buy. And you'll be shocked. People love, want, and need to buy. All righty. Um, Lexi says, any resources you'd recommend for overcoming objections? So here's the, so, so man, great question, Lexi. Great question. Okay. And I could, man, I could do an hour on just objections and closing, but to be brief, the smart thing to do is to prevent objections, not to fix the objection. And professionals know that there are going to be objections. Amateurs say, oh, I hope they don't object. Okay. That's an important distinction. Amateurs hope they don't object. Pros know they're going to. So if I know Lexi's going to object to my offer, and I know the three or four most common objections, I, as a professional, I'm going to introduce each objection somewhere in my talk because it doesn't hurt as much when I bring it up as when Lexi brings it up. And plus, I control the narrative. I control the story. And then I'm going to take that objection, you know, the number one reason that people don't buy from me is because of finance. Okay, they look at the check they have to write and they're like, ah, oh, it's just so much. I'm like, I totally get that. Okay, but the interesting thing is this. If I charge you $25,000 and you earn a million dollars, do you care? And the answer is they don't. But if you just... And, and so what I'm doing there is I'm um, I'm bringing up the objection and then I'm dealing with the objection, which is it, before I've asked them to buy, okay? And so the best way to deal with objections is to prevent them from coming up, not not to try and fix them. And the, and the, and the one objection that is a deal killer is trust. If they don't trust you, they will not buy from you. And they won't tell you. They won't say, I don't trust you. They just won't buy and you won't know why. Okay. So how do you build trust? It's pretty simple. Be trustworthy. And most people aren't. And people can sense it and feel it. Be trustworthy. Do what you're going to say. Keep every promise outperform the promises that you make. All right. Mike says, any strategies for prospecting? We know our product and, and who we want to sell to, but are having trouble getting in front of them. Can you ask Mike what he sells? Mike, what do you sell? Let's see if Mike, Mike responds here. Someone's a consultant. Can find the mute button. We sell consulting services, digital transformation. Uh, so we we and our primary clients are Fortune 500 companies, and so we're very good at selling within the companies we're already at. But it's new client acquisition. Say we're already at a a T-Mobile, we want to go work with AT and T or other folks uh, there, um, and we know the areas, and we know the titles, and we know customer profiles and their typical journey, but. Uh, we're having trouble, you know, LinkedIn messaging and some of those tactics are, uh, we're not yielding the prospects that we like. 
Yeah, I understand. So, um, and that's very common because Mike's making enterprise sales. So he's selling into great big companies that have, you know, if you're selling into Verizon, Verizon has 232,000 employees. That's a, that's a beast to kind of manage. So one is you probably know the titles of the people that are buying from you now in your enterprise clients. And so I would go to a, I'd continue to do the LinkedIn thing. Okay. E even though to me, that's a trust thing. That's not really going to generate a lot of business, but I, but I would continue to do that because it doesn't cost much, but I would go to a data product and th this is not free, but, um, Zoom Info is good. It's pretty expensive. It's fifteen thousand um, dollars. Seamless.ai is about fifteen hundred dollars. I would go to a product like Seamless, and in the companies that fit my demographics, I would go look for everybody, the individual that had any of those titles of people that I'm currently interacting with, and and it. In, in a big company, like in AT&T, you might get six or 16 names, okay? And you don't really know who makes the decision. And many times in those big companies, it's not just it's not just Don makes the decision. It's a committee of three or four people that make the decision, okay? And depending on the price point of what you sell, it may be a budget item. So, you, you know, you have to do work ahead of the next budget to be able to make the sale. But the first thing on generating more leads is I got to identify the who. Okay. And I want to get as granular as possible. And then I have to put material in front of all of them, whether it's email, direct mail, telephone calls. Okay. Because I have to take strangers, people who do not know who I am. The very first step in marketing is how do I take strangers and make them aware of who I am? And so that would be a good start. All right. Next question. Yes. How can I get over my objection to social media? I can't stand the inauthentic relation. I don't know. Can we lock you in a closet until you say I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I, I, I don't, I don't really know that. I can tell you this. The last guy on the planet to get a cell phone was me. The last guy, I have about 30,000 connections, maybe 25, maybe 40. I don't know. I've, about 30,000 connections on LinkedIn. Several years ago, after maybe 10 years, I had 400 and some friends of mine were like, man, you have so much content, you know, I can't encourage you enough. And it took them about a year to convince me. But, well, well, I guess here's the easy way. Do you want to sell a lot of what you sell? Because if you do, you're going to have to get on social. For the trust aspect alone. I don't care if you ever buy an ad. For the trust aspect alone, you got to get on social. I hope that helps. If not, we probably have a closet somewhere. <laughs> Just kidding. Thank you so much, Don. Uh, Finley, you want to go ahead and wrap us up here? Yes, of course. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, be on the lookout for a recap to your inbox in the next 24 hours with notes and materials from the session today, as well as a recording to share with your teams. Um, if you enjoyed this thought leadership workshop, you can find out more information on our next event, a 60 minute habits workshop on brand promise, building trust and consistency to help you stand out in the marketplace. And that'll be coming up on October 10th at petracoach.com slash Petra events. As a part of Petra Coach's mission to positively impacting 10 million human beings, we thank you all for being here today and have a great rest of your Thursday. Thanks so much, Don. We appreciate your Thanks, time. Thanks, Petra Coach. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Thanks, Don.